This week on Death of the Reader, Nero and Archie have gotten involved in the case, but the clock is ticking as their train slowly approaches. Can they solve the crime before it leaves the station? All that and more, now on Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds. This is your murder mystery world tour. And Herds, I am so excited to continue with too many cooks. I'm ready to continue. I'm just hoping that I can stick in the lead here. Look, this is a complicated novel. There's all sorts of characters being thrown us left, right, and center. You couldn't possibly figure out who the killer was, sir. Well, I mean, I could figure out who the killer was if the killer wasn't actually one of the people that's being thrown at us left, right, and center. They're more what? like left over in the distance. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I see how <laughs> But it we'll is. Get, get into that we'll a bit later in, in the show. We're doing chapters 7 to 13 today. Yes. Inclusive. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the closing chapter. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. It was it was a weird time. I will say, the big twist of the final chapter, we uh-huh. won't spoil it immediately for you. We'll uh-huh. talk about it coming up shortly. Oh, but so good. I, I kind of had to rush reading this book a little bit, and uh-huh. I got to chapter 13, and I was skimming through, and I was like, wait, what? There's a there's a hole in that? How did that get there? <laughs> Who did they borrow that from? Uh, but no. Where did I was, that bullet come from? Was there a nail? Was I I was just a fool. I was Somebody's just a fool. finger? No, sir. This is why you should read your books thoroughly. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. All right, we're going to get into it then. If you haven't read the novel, you know what? Maybe listen on anyway. Maybe you'll enjoy yourself. Maybe you will enjoy yourself. you'll enjoy yourself. We don't actually know who the culprit is just yet, so maybe it's worth trying to figure it out along with us. Yeah, yeah. But yes, I think the main thing that is worth talking about in this section of the novel is civil rights. Yeah. And basically, we spoke with Dr. Mike Grost on a previous episode of the show about Mm. S.S. Van Dyne being a proponent of civil rights movements and various other murder mystery authors doing the same thing because it was a genre that seemed to be, you know, very open to that sort of thing, unless you're G.K. Chesterton. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. We won't talk about him. (laughs) I mean, we might in a later episode, but we will definitely ridicule him. Well, I hope so. I hope so. But basically, this story uses a lot of racial slurs, it uses a lot of racial Mm. stereotypes, but it uses them in a very intelligent way where I think that it is expressing distaste for those things. It's fascinating talking about this novel in a a modern context because for the time, this is very progressive. Yes. The way that the novel treats black people in the novel is incredibly respectful compared to how you know, people of, of ethnicity were treated back back in the day. Generally, the characters who are using particularly foul language are not the heroes of the story. The yeah. heroes, Nero Wolf in particular, which I was pleasantly, not surprised, but pleasantly, you know, uh, able to receive, he's a, he's a very respectful civil person, as is Archie Goodwin, obviously. Particularly in the quote-unquote interrogation scene, where we gather all the uh, all of the servants together and we just, we serve them tea. Yeah. It's lovely. It's it's a really fantastic scene. I think the main thing is with the use of language in this story is as you say everyone who is using slurs are, you know, they're the they're the they're the dogs of the of the situation. Yes. They're the police small town cops who have no understanding yes. for the the whims of modern it's... men. And I think you can see every time a slur is used, Archie and Nero both immediately start mm-hmm. using another term. And yep. it tends to be a term that they haven't used before, yep. almost intentionally pointing out here's another option. Yeah. They don't actively combat anyone or argue with them uh, very sparingly but they are actively pushing against this this stigmatism that these that these characters are putting forward and i i really love that yeah and perhaps the most offensive thing that is done in the book is that the culprit is caught wearing blackface oh my goodness which is which you, is terrible how would you even adapt that <laughs> yeah how today? would you adapt that you wouldn't be able to it'd be too offensive but, but- the, the good thing yeah. is that, of course, because it's the culprit, they're going to get their comeuppance, and that's obviously present, presented in the book as a detestable thing. And I think that, as we say, that is an admirable quality of this book, particularly for its time. Mm-hmm, we know mm-hmm. from Dr. Mike Grost, again, that uh, Rex Stout himself was yep. actually the leader of a World War II-era writer's group whose yep. goal promoted non-stereotyped treatment of minorities yep. in the media, which is a really important thing for its, its time. It's huge. It's a huge part of this book. I'm so glad we're doing this book. Ah. Oh. Excites me. That said, Nero Wolf is a terrible sexist. But <laughs> we won't hold that too much against him just because he thinks that all women are hysterical. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think I think the interesting question there, and I, let's get into this, sure. is that I think that Nero Wolf is presented as a character 
who's that that mm. is his character flaw, right? Yes, is I that agree. he he is a romantic, but he's a romantic for food. He's a romantic mm. for culture. He's not a romance romantic for romance itself. Yes, sure. And I think that that's presented as as his character flaw because everyone is constantly critiquing yeah. it. Yeah. And even the some of the terrible things he says about women in this book, yeah. everyone immediately calls him out yes. on them. It's it's somewhere between a joke on the part of the writer saying, "Oh, this Nero Wolf with his old fashioned views. Look at it. Look at what an old awful man he is." Mm. Because that's, I mean, this is why I find Nero so interesting as a character is that he is a three-dimensional one. Yeah. He is not just the detective who gets everything right and is, you know, a projection of the of the author themselves. He has these very progressive views on, on ethnicity and people of color. He has very backwards views about women. He loves food. He's yeah. lazy. He needs someone to run around and be his legs for him. I love him as a character, personally. I think the line that perhaps most reflects this whole ordeal to me is uh, it's said in the context of talking about love and romance by mm. Nero Wolfe, or it's actually a quote that someone else quotes Nero Wolfe saying uh-huh. from, I think, a previous book. Uh-huh. As you say, a hole in the ice is dangerous only to those who go skating. And I think that that's very much the approach that this book takes to sensitive topics, mm. right? Is that it's taking a risk by doing yeah. this in a time where this was perhaps objectionable, but it, it's made the the book age much better than it otherwise would have for the language it uses. Yeah, there is a uh, a particular a particular quote, uh, a particular discussion that Nero Wolf has when he's trying to he's trying to interrogate this group of of black servants and trying to encourage them to stand with him on the side of justice. The ideal human agreement is one in which distinctions of race and color and religion are totally disregarded. Anyone helping to preserve those distinctions is postponing that ideal, and you are certainly helping to preserve them. If in a question of murder you permit your action to be influenced by the complexion of the man who committed it, no matter whether you yourself are white or pink or black. What I think is particularly fun about that excerpt, he doesn't specify within that particular uh, that particular train of thought. The statement that he's making is to everyone, to, to the white people who discriminate, to the black people who discriminate. He's trying to make this statement that we need to put color completely to the side, yeah. which is insane for the time. And I love it. Oh, yeah. And it's not to say that he, he was the only writer that was doing it, but I think no, that it's still worth pointing out and complimenting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Even if everyone's doing it, it's still something we should acknowledge. Yeah. Um, especially for the time it was written in. So that's, uh, that's all of the, you know, social civil rights movement stuff that this book does for now. For now, um, <laughs> we, we'll maybe get into some more of it a bit later. But I think it's time we talk about the actual, you know, the puzzle, the murder. Oh, I not, guess not, to, not to say that we mm. should solve it right now, but I think one of the most interesting scenes that goes down in terms of the puzzle mm. in this section of the story is our discussion with uh, Leo Coyne. And the intro to this discussion is one of the funnier moments of the book. Yeah, it's it it reads like a parody of um of like NCIS. <laughs> when Abby, the forensic expert, says, I've put it all, I've put the fingerprints through the lab and this piece of plastic, it's from this place in town and yeah. it could have only been this person. Like, the, the scene is that that Nero Wolf pulls Archie in to do this little performance where they pretend to have fingerprints that they've, you know, run through the procedures yeah. and it's all very vague. <laughs> and they convince Leo that they can, you know, track her, they can, they can pin her down as the culprit of the crime through these fingerprints that mean literally nothing to them. <laughs> I love that scene. It's fantastic. I love the way this novel plays with your expectations. Yeah. Oh. Especially when we look at writers like Van Dyne, who Rex that was obviously influenced by, we saw a lot of the same sort of thing in his novels, yeah. where basically he was saying, well, what all of this, you know, all of this chemistry nonsense, it's just made up rubbish. We need to deal with the psychology. psychology and yes. that's exactly that's, how it's presented. Uh-huh. Except yeah. that we're not being given an, a verbal essay by the detective Way it just happens it. and it's a moment of comedy mm. and i yeah. love i love the way that yeah. it delivers it with such a lightheartedness they are in fact using the psychology of the the process of hunting a suspect yeah. to lure leo in to get her to tell us what we what she knows yeah it's so good and i love archie's perspective where he's slowly figuring it out along mm-hmm. with us mm-hmm. and he's like ah, i saw the moment that miss coin entered the room that this was you know this was where i had to pick up my notebook and uh, <laughs> Archie, once again, just the just the best character. I mean, I I like Nero. Look, which is very interesting because you know, obviously, on this show, I'm presented as more of the detective solve everything type, and I you're know. presented as much more of the Archie type character. But it seems that we consistently like the opposite characters. Look, you like what you're not. Okay, Opp- opposites attract. They say this is true. Opposites attract. But flex. We're in a war zone here, okay? There is no love. There is no love in war. We can't have it here. I'm sorry, Flex. 
Uh, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the other fantastic comedy character moments that this book has is when Savan, the the host of the entire event in which this murder has happened, mm-hmm. gets up to give his his speech on food, which everyone's been hyping up and yes. talking about for days and days and days. And then we sit down, and Archie's like, "Oh boy, I can't wait!" And he starts starts speaking in French, yeah. and Archie just goes. <sighs> and reaches for the bottle of Cognac in front yeah, of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You might as well just take a nap at that point. We'll be back in short order with our discussion on Is This Puzzle Fair? Can I Solve It? And all of that fun, good stuff in the murder mystery genre solving bitsy who's a what's it of the show. What was that? I don't know. It was me making up words. It's like something I'd do on this show. What is this? You're stealing my bit. Well, we've got to, we've got to trade chairs occasionally. I suppose I say so. as I'm standing up. Look, I enjoy sitting in this show. It's much more comfortable. I don't know how you do it. It's, I've got to work on the legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do some do some crunches while you while you do on the recording. <laughs> it's been way too long. We'll see you on the next part. This is Death of the Reader. We are discussing Too Many Cooks by Rex Stout, and we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SCR. This is Flex and Herds chatting with someone you've all been waiting for. Yes, Herd said last week we would get the author of this fantastic <laughs> blog about the cooking of Nero Wolf and, and Co. on, and you've done it, Herd. Yeah, I did. I did. I did get her on. Uh, this is after a week of hardship and, and fighting. Uh, Kirsten Wright uh, created the Inspired by Wolf blog and longtime fan of the culinary arts. Kirsten, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> so, Kirsten, I, I know that. Much as uh, Nirable Fenachi Goodwin uh, would, you know, sequester themselves in their brownstone house for the rest of the year after solving a, a case, you have uh, kept yourself hidden for the past couple of years. Uh, I'd love to know what inspired you to create this this blog in the in the first place. Yeah, I was thinking about that. It almost feels like it was like a different time on the internet, right? Like it was, mm. you know, blogs are really big and there were quite a few, I guess, of the other, you know, blogs where you cook through a cookbook. There was um, Julie and Julia, but there was, you know, I was reading, I guess, a lot of blogs where, you know, people were taking various, various recipe books, you know, for, you know, high-end restaurant recipe books or, you know, classic literature recipe books, whatever. And um, yeah, I sort of hit on Nero Wolf because, you know, I'm a massive um, mystery fan, read a lot of classic, especially classic mysteries. And yeah, the combination of food and the mystery sort of part of it really appealed. And plus, I really liked that the, there was a Nero Wolf cookbook that was written by Rex Stout, the, the author of all the Nero Wolf books. I, that felt authentic to me or something. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess that sort of, that was the inspiration behind it. But I did make sure it was inspired by Wolf, not just cooking through the cookbook, mm, yeah, because yeah. I did want to sort of give myself some flexibility to do, yeah, what I wanted, not always just just around the Nero Wolf stuff. So yeah. I yeah. have been trying over the past few weeks to find a copy of the the Rex Stout Nero Wolf cookbook. Yeah, and there was one copy that I found that was nearby to us, but it got bought up just before I went mm. for it. <laughs> I think I might have got mine off eBay or something. Like, I remember it was a bit of a search to yeah. to get it even back then, yeah. Now, I will say, Kirsten, I'm very impressed that uh, trawling through your blog, I found you were able to detail the entire rich history of the Wolf series with baked goods, specifically cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so I did basically, like I decided again, I wanted to learn how to decorate cookies and decorate cakes and that sort of thing. And I was like, yeah, how can I make this about Nero Wolf? Okay, <laughs> off we go. <laughs> yeah, it means I've got some quite interesting cookie cutters, I guess. I can slightly, imagine. <laughs> slightly niche niche cookie cutters. <laughs> yeah, the the wolf on your, on your blog is picture perfect, I would say. <laughs> now, <Thank you. laughs> I have to ask, what dish from the Wolf series would you recommend for cooks at home from the vast library? I know oh, it's hard to choose. Gosh, oh, that's a really difficult one. <laughs> um, look, I do actually really like Nero Wolf scrambled eggs. Um, oh, that's mm. a recipe that it takes him 45 minutes to make scrambled eggs. <laughs> you know, is it worth it? I, I think it's worth doing once. And it's like a fairly, you know, at least you only need eggs. I think that one's definitely worth a, worth a try. I think if people like 
baking. There's some nice, you know, baked, you know, sort of French style baked recipes to do. I mean, it's all just a lot of butter, basically. That's sort of the Nero Wolf way, isn't it? Lots of butter, very rich sauces. Mm. Yeah, that sort of thing. But yeah, I start with the eggs. That's a good place to start. Mm. That's something anyone could do. I've actually had a little peek at uh, some notes on the recipe book that that shift with Too Many Cooks, uh, which is the novel that we're covering this week. Yeah. And I, I've noticed, and, and you've commented that many of the recipes have uh, vague directions based yeah. on the time of day or the weather climate or the side of the planet that you're on. Is this quite <laughs> a, a product of old fashioned cookbooks or a, a twist to add to the, the mystery of the series? Oh, probably a bit of both, I think. <laughs> I mean, certainly, obviously, in too many cooks, they're keeping their recipes close to themselves. Um, they don't want to, you know, share the specifics so people can't replicate them. But yeah, maybe it's maybe it's more, yeah, looking at the sort of older fashioned cookbooks where it was just, you know, put these things together, you'll be fine. You know what you're doing. So there might be a bit of that in there as well, I guess. Now, on your blog, Kirsten, you mentioned that Nero Wolf views his world through, well, his world and his life through food. How does this help you connect with him being a chef yourself? Yeah, obviously, food is so integral to yeah, his world and his persona, which I guess we all aspire to maybe, but probably none of us, the rest of us can't just, yeah, hole up in a brownstone and cook all day. I, I think it's really interesting. I, I was sort of thinking about this this morning. It seems like, you know, he's obviously an intellectual. He, he reads a lot. He's very well read. And the food sort of, for me, seems to fit into that. Like it's that say it's a real in a sense, intellectual exploration yeah, of yeah, gastronomy. Sure. It's not, I mean, he enjoys that and he, you know, he talks about the sort of central aspect of it. There's something really intellectual about it for him that appeals to me because it feels quite um, deliberate, I guess, in a way that mm. if you look at other sort of fictional cooking or fictional food in, in other mystery books, it, it doesn't obviously have that, that centrality to it. So, mm. Yeah, it is really part of his yeah whole outlook on life. I think. Yeah. Now you mention other fictional cooking in there. What what fiction series do you think could do with a cookbook the most? <laughs> See, this is quite funny because I don't, maybe I shouldn't admit to this. So I sort of stopped doing the Nero Wolf blog because I started writing a blog about um, the food of Star Trek. So oh, I went and created. Oh. The food of Star Trek. I also don't do that anymore. Um, but that's online as well. If if there's any crossover between Nero Wolf readers and Star Trek you know, fans. I think um, we actually came across that on a late night <laughs> special about Star Trek that we did a few months ago. We yeah, completely right. unrelated to this show. So that's yeah. hilarious that that's that. you as well. <laughs> yeah, that's me as well. So <laughs> that one was a bit more tricky because like I did have to make up the recipes from scratch and stuff, obviously. Um, yeah. So obviously I'm going to go for something like Star Trek where it, like the food's super out there and, you know, how do you translate what you see on the screen, that, that real visual element into, into actual edible food. Um, I really liked a few years Years ago, there was the Hannibal TV show and the person who did all the set design, like food design for that show, because obviously it's quite an important part of Hannibal. She wrote a cookbook as well, talk, both talking about the design of it, but then also translating it into recipes. And I thought that was really clever. But uh, I think for me, Star Trek would still be the ultimate, even though it's not really in this mystery vein, I guess. I, I can definitely agree with that. I think that there is some some excellent visual design in some of the food in Star Trek. Now, turning it back to Nero Wolf, mm. iconic iconic mystery series has a gargantuan number of books compared to a lot of stories in its space. Which one is your favorite Rex Stout Nero Wolf novel? Too Many Cooks was always one of my favorites, I have to say, because of, you know, all the chefs coming together and the personalities and the, the big banquet, the food mm. is, is so central to it. I do sort of like the ones when he leaves the house. Like, there's not many, but the few where he's sort of <laughs> forced to go out and do that. I always think that's sort of fun to see him outside of his element. There's got one, he's got one, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. He has to go back to Montenegro where he's from and sort mm. of, you know, hunt, a, hunt the killer of a friend. And yeah, yeah, that one's quite a good one. I think he had a pretty good setup, did Rex out. Um, yeah, sort of able to do what he liked, I think. But yeah, um, and again, the sort of, I uh, really like how the brown zone is described in the books. You know, you've sort of got the working area, like where the office and stuff is. And then there's the... Um, the kitchen, obviously, and then, you know, this whole upper floor just devoted to orchids. It's, mm. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> it's fantastic. It'd be great to be able to go and visit, you know. <laughs> it's indulgent, to say the least, yeah. which is fantastic. We definitely did miss out on a bit of the character of the setting of Nero Wolf by picking too many cooks where it's one of the few books where he's actually outside the house. True. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, there, there's always a good good bit of fun to be had there when you go back to the more standard run of the mill yeah. Rex Stout novels. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed we didn't get to meet Fritz in this novel. I've heard nothing but good things about him. 
Yeah, Fritz is a great character. I mean, I, I it's sort of interesting because again, when I, I re- reread Too Many Cooks, like I, I really like all the characters, but I also was, I'm like, well, there's no women. Well, the women are, you know, pretty much non-existent as characters, mm. and obviously there's some issues with race. So it's sort of interesting, I guess, to see it through those lens while I still really enjoy the characters that do exist there. Like Archie Goodwin's a fantastic character, mm. obviously, and all the Saul Panzer and the others that the other detectives that help out that again weren't really too much in too many cooks but are in much more in some of the other stories are yeah they're great they're fun characters as well it's a great universe that he was able to create well thank you so much kirsten for joining us here on death of the reader discussing too many cooks rex stout nero wolf cooking and all things delicious and delectable it's been a pleasure having you on thank you very much thank you this is death of the reader see you the next part You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds. We are discussing Too Many Cooks by Rex Stout. And I'm ready, Herds. What? Last week, I was confused. Damn right you were. You had no clue what was going on. Well, that's not true. I had half an idea who was going you on. You had 0.3% of an idea, so... We are discussing chapters 7 to 13, inclusive mm-hmm. of Too Many Cooks. Mm-hmm. Last week, I thought it was Dina Lasio and an accomplice, but I couldn't quite pin down who it was, uh-huh. but I reckon I've got it this time. Really? Yes, I do, her. Who's your culprit, then? Just lay it on the table my, right now. My, my culprit, my murderer in this one, is Raymond Liggett. What? But he was in New York. He was, or so we were told. What? And his accomplice, Dina Lazio, who I think is actually the one pulling the strings. Oh, interesting. Yes. She's some kind of criminal mastermind. Absolutely. That's what that scene was when she was like, oh, my poor husband is going to be murdered. Yeah. With poison. It's, and I found poison in the salt shaker. It's a classic trope is to it? have the is guilty it? person come up and try and assuade guilt onto well, somebody else. They did They did ring that up. They did say, you know, maybe, maybe she's trying to draw attention away from herself by actually, you know, prophesizing the murder. But, prophesizing. You know, that's basically what she did. <laughs> prophesizing. That's the word. Yes. Now, I think the most important thing with Dina Lazio here mm-hmm. is a line that we, we she's get innocent. from her in Chapter 9, mm-hmm. where she says that Vukic had forgiven what Nero Wolf could not. Which, Ooh. if we look at what Vukic actually says in earlier chapters, does not seem to be the case. Oh, interesting. He's not as openly bitter as Nero Wolf is, but I don't think he's quite forgiven Dina Lazio for what she's done. Mm, Which, in case you are uh, not entirely caught up on the book, is that she abandoned Marku Vukic for our dead man. It's true. Philip Lazio. She's a, she's a bit of a swamp woman, as Archie would put it. Dina Lazio, Ben. Mm-hmm. Suspicious as all get out. I don't think so. But let's go with your theory for now, Flex. Let's right, say right, Dina Lazio right. has it out for Vukic, has it out for, for Lazio. She's willing to murder her own husband. Why Why have you summoned this, uh, this other gentleman to the stand? Well, okay. Raymond Liggett, I said last week that I would not be happy mm. with this man being yeah. the culprit. Yeah, I don't know why he flipped around so suddenly. That be- makes no sense. I'm still not happy. Okay. I'm not happy. Good. Right. None of us are happy then. <laughs> None okay. of us are happy here. So the the main thing that tipped me over the edge was mm-hmm. actually, interestingly enough, a line from my, my second pick mm-hmm. for Killer, which was Alberto Malfi. Ah. Alberto Malfi and Raymond Liggett have come to town together, have been speaking in suspicious, strange, cruel ways, talking about stabbing people, which admittedly everyone in the book has I been I was going to say, everyone's talking about stabbing people, stabbing pigs, feeding them, feeding them nuts so they're nice and juicy and delicious. Everyone's talking about eating and everyone stabbing. Everyone is talking about eating and stabbing. But yeah. I think that there is a particular Especially malice last year. to the way that Alberto Malfi and Raymond Liggett come in and talk mm, about stabbing Corsicans. And here's the line that pushed me over the edge. A woman like her doesn't have friends, only slaves. We also, in that same scene, find out that apparently Dina Lazio had induced a cocaine habit in Vukic. Mm. And I, I, I was a little torn, Herds. I was a little torn between Alberto Amalfi and Raymond Liggett, but this line pushed me over the edge because, Herds, if it is true that Dina Lazio has only slaves and not lovers, then it would mean that the culprit was probably one of those slaves. Mm. And if it was Malfi, would he have the self-awareness to say such a thing? I think not. Well, this is an intriguing little argument that you bring to the table, Flex, Mm. but I don't know. I feel like that doesn't make, you know, a huge amount of sense. I don't know why would Raymond Liggett even show up the day after the murder. By the way, 
Was he supposed to be in New York? He was supposed to be in New York. However, everyone that says that that is the case is working for him. Oh, interesting. No one can prove otherwise. We also have a line where in an unrelated incident, Nero and Archie are talking about how he can't be in two places at once. Even a jury wouldn't believe that. Me thinks this is Rex Stout trying to be clever. Trying. Trying to be clever. He's a clever boy. He is a clever boy. And I don't know, that line to me when I went over it, I thought to myself, you know, this seems like the truth being put in our face, but twisted around to try bamboozle us. Mm. So that's the theory I'm banking on. Why would Raymond even feel the need to show up? If he's done the killing, why stick around even? I will, and there is... I will tell you the answer to that question after you've posed this theory, because I don't want to cancel out what uh-huh. you're about to say. You're going to try to anyway, but we all know. I we will all try. Know. We all know I'm right here. Look, Herds' track record has been... At least 10,000%. 10,000%. points. I want to check the record here, okay? Zero points. Now, anyway, so there is a character who has been mentioned a couple of times. One, Zolotta of Tarragona. Uh, And what's more, before you call nonsense on this, because I have a legitimate backing to this theory. Nonsense. He was the first character mentioned as having a a death uh, or a killing wish for Mr. Lazio. And you know what, Hertz? He's mentioned by Berin in the opening chapter. And you know what, Hertz? He's the first person mentioned. I thought... Flex? I thought that Flex? that was going to end up being it, and I was going to be real mad. I was reading that opening chapter back again, and I thought to myself, Rex Stout, what are you doing here? Have you put your culprit in this book in a line in the opening chapter, but then not actually had him appear in the entire book? What if he's masquerading as someone else? That was actually my my theory. Yeah, that dude. Was, that was what That's was my gonna... theory too. <laughs> Man, maybe I'm just wrong. But no. No herds. No. And I here's don't think why. So. Here's why. Why flex? Because Educators. we get Alberto Malfi talking about the 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 path of murder that leads to the head chef position at the Churchill. Mm-hmm. He says that as much as he would like to have that position, he would much rather it go to the man who taught him, Jerome Berin. Ah. But you know what? He says he wouldn't murder Baron for that position, but you know what he would do? What? Allow him to be framed for murder. Ooh, that's an interesting theory. That's an interesting now theory, like. isn't it just? Like. Isn't it just? Also, we have all of these scenes talking about all of the terrible things and disgrace that has come upon the Churchill Hotel because of Philip Lazio's actions. And what were all of those scenes for, if not to provide motive for the killer. Uh-huh. Here's the thing. Uh-huh. Is that everyone gives those opinions, but you know the only man in the book who is connected to all of them other than Philip Lassio himself? Raymond. Raymond? Liggett. Wow. This is some this is some hot takes I'm hearing right here. It's some pretty hot takes, And hurts. all after the ceiling of Rognon au Montagne. <laughs> uh, no, Montagne. While we were off air in the break there, <laughs> Herds, Herds, no! Herds went to translate this you term. Help me. It means kidney in the mountains. Yes. It, sounded, it sounded like Google Translate was having a stroke. As we all know, <laughs> kidneys in the mountains, that's where they taste the best. Get yourself some kidneys. Cut them out, take them to the mountains. Once again, we've struck the old Fowl Pass. Fowl Pass, that's the one. Or is it Falks Pass? I don't even remember the joke. Falks Pass was the original joke, sir. (laughs) That's all right. If only we had writers on this show to make sure our jokes were consistent, Herds. Well, you know what? In the future, maybe. Well, Well, I guess we do have Rex Stout. He is technically a writer. It's true. Really, every writer that we follow. Rex Stout, you have to hold us accountable, sir. Yeah. He's probably spinning in his grave over this. This is why we don't cover living writers. This is why we don't. Because then they'd be able to control us. They'd be like, you can't say that. That's, that's dangerous. Not how that's pronounced. That's it's dangerous. Nero Wolfe. But yes, I don't know, Herds. <laughs> I, I'm i still very scared. I'm very scared. Good. That, you should be. That Rex Stout, who supposedly does not believe in the fair play of the murder mystery genre in the same way that our beloved Ronald Knox and mm. S.S. Van Dyne did, I'm scared that this man is about to drop a culprit on me who is not featured once in the story except what by mention. It? What if it is Zolotta? I'm scared. I'm just saying. Zolotta. Zolotta, my... But I'm Gotta. going to say Done. this, Herds. Yeah. That if I were to lose points over someone not playing the game fairly, so be it. Okay. So be it, okay. Herds. You, if this is the hill you're going to die this on, This is okay the hill it. I will die okay on. okay with it. It's fine. I will pick the fair play option, even if it means I lose one singular point. I can't believe you're like... Taking the high route on this. You say this like you don't always give me the most complicated, most skewed detective novels they're at. <laughs> Just because I enjoy them more, you're a monster. Listen, a true monster. 
you know, antagonist of this show. We have to have some conflict on this show, Herbs. I mean, we always have conflict. And, and if it means that I have to keep picking books that are way too complicated for you to solve, and you have Thank to keep you. picking books that aren't fair enough for me to solve. That's it. Eventually, someone's going to win this murder mystery game. And so far, I'm in the lead, Herbs. That's right. The only way that this murder mystery Let's game shawl. is ending up in Let's your shawl. favor <laughs> is going to be some real dodgy picks on novels. Let's do it. That's the plan. <laughs> Well, you had to pick the dodgy one for me. Unfortunately, that's how we've rigged this uh, game we'll, entirely we'll, in your favor. We'll talk a bit more about what novel we're going to pick very shortly on the show. I'm very excited for this one. I think you'll actually enjoy this one a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm looking forward to I it. I mean, I hope you enjoy all of my picks, even if they are, you know, swayed in my favor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, we'll be talking about that next week. This has been Death of the Reader. We are discussing Too Many Cooks by Rex Stout. We will be talking next week, chapters 14 to the end of the story, and we will see you then. 